Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily, the first English news program in Poland. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. The main funeral ceremonies for former Prime Minister Jan Olszewski was held today after a mass at St. John's Cathedral in Warsaw. The main ceremony took place at the Polish capital's Provonsky Military Cemetery following the tributes at the Warsaw Uprising Monument. Assisted by the army and the police honorary guard, Oshevsky's funeral has been arranged as a state ceremony. Jan Olszewski, the first prime minister of free, independent Poland. As a teenager, Olszewski participated in the 1944 Warsaw Uprising against Poland's Nazi German occupiers. Once in the cafe shop, a conversation began on the subject of what's going on in the world, and I did not know that I was talking to Mr. Jan. The main funeral ceremonies began with a funeral mass in the Arch Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. 18-month-old Alexander suffers from a rare leg defect, which happens once in a million births. An operation in the United States is his only hope, though very expensive. The family needs 300,000 slotis for the surgery, but the people of Poland has been very generous and working towards the goal. Amongst the charitable is the famous Polish director Patryk Vega, who offered a role in one of his movies in exchange for help. I think that people want to unite, they want to help, but in my opinion it should be done in a spirited and exciting way. I am a film director, so I can offer the thrill of being on a movie set as well as playing in one of my upcoming movies. Hence, we started an auction where people can bid and win a role in my movie. When Alexander was born, nobody could tell his parents that the boy is sick. The boy's parents, Ola and Mateusz, recalled the day in our studio at the beginning of February. When Alexander was born, the doctors focused on his right foot as it was unnaturally curved. I think that's because his condition is so rare, they did not think that it was a symptom of him lacking a tibia. Only two weeks later, when we did an x-ray on his leg, did the doctors realize what the problem was. When the diagnosis was made, it was like a judgment for Alexander's parents. They knew that they couldn't give up. The fight for the boy's health is ongoing and his parents want to win it. What is the most beautiful part of living with Alexander? Alexander himself. He brings us so much joy. What kind of a boy is he? He's a regular boy, much like any other. He just needs a working leg. Little Alexander is the apple of his parents' eye, and for the people who help him, their little hero. Even though there is less and less time to collect money, everyone is sure that it's going to be fine. Many people reach out to me, some people's stories touch me deeply, and that was the case with Alexander. That is why I wanted to help. This is the battle with time, the fight for Alexander standing up on his feet. Everyone believes in only one result, and that's victory. The deadlock regarding the adoption of the federal budget stretches to a second month. The dispute between the U.S. President Donald Trump and the Democratic Party for the border wall funding has resulted in a shutdown of the federal government. There has yet to be an agreement on the near $6 billion border wall funding, but Trump has announced to sign the budget law to avoid further suspension of the government's function. President Donald Trump signs a declaration for a national emergency to address the national security and humanitarian crisis at the southern border. Donald Trump repeated on Friday that he would declare a state of emergency so that he would get funding for a wall on the border with Mexico without the Congress. He added that he would use the executive power to circumvent the obstruction attempt of the Congress and would obtain more public funding for the project. I'm going to be signing a national emergency. And it's been signed many times before. It's been signed by other presidents. From 1977 or so, it gave the presidents the power. There's rarely been a problem. They signed it. In his speech, Trump emphasized that he was doing this to combat the crisis of national security. So we're going to be signing today and registering national emergency 
And it's a great thing to do because we have an invasion of drugs, invasion of gangs, invasion of people, and it's unacceptable. And by signing the national emergency, something signed many times by other presidents, many, many times, President Obama. In fact, we may be using one of the national emergencies that he signed having to do with cartels, criminal cartels. It's a very good emergency that he signed, and we're going to use parts of it in our dealings on cartels. So that would be a second national emergency, but in that case, it's already in place. Mexicans living near the border with the USA say that the wall Donald Trump is attempting to build is unnecessary and will not solve any problems. The crisis is false. In fact, the border at Ciudad Juarez and El Paso is one of the safest that there is in the United States. And regarding the wall and the emergency that Donald Trump is asking for, it's a tantrum that he has for his stubbornness that he wants to build it, but the wall is unnecessary. American delegates and the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, proceeded with their meetings on the sideline of Munich Security Conference today. Following the criticism of the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence rebuking European powers over Iran and Venezuela, rejecting the call by German Chancellor to include Russia in global cooperation efforts. Pence told delegates in a speech today that the EU should follow the United States in pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal and recognizing the head of the Venezuela Congress, Juan Guaido, as the country's president. Pence's speech was the latest attempt by a Trump official to put the president's America First agenda into a coherent policy plan. In her speech before Pence, Merkel questioned if the U.S. decision to leave the nuclear deal was the best way to tackle the problems in the region and defend the Germany's foreign trade relations and ties with Russia, urging global leaders meeting in Munich to work together to reach a solution for the world's problems. That's it for today. See you next time on Poland Daily. But stay tuned for the Poland Daily Weather Report, followed by Poland Daily Business. Welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Tonight, the temperatures will be from minus one in Katowice and Lublin, and up to four degrees in the northern parts of Poland, as well as in Szczecin. If we look at tomorrow, we will see that the south will be the warmest, up to 12 degrees Celsius in Kraków, Katowice and Wrocław, and 11 degrees in Zielona Góra. Most parts will remain dry. However, we are expecting some rain around Olsztyn, Białystok, Gdańsk and Koszalin. The next three days will be mainly sunny, but with some rain as well. The maximum temperature will be 12 degrees in the southwest on Monday. Also 11 degrees in the same area will be seen on Tuesday. Wednesday will be a bit cooler. Nine degrees will be the maximum. This is all for tonight. Thank you. You are watching Poland Daily Business Edition. Our guest tonight is Jakub Wiech. Sir, welcome. Hello. Analyst and writer and author of Energetica 24 portal. Uh, sir, uh, we have a very hot summer recently, and Indeed. I remember three years ago we had the power outages due to the inefficient cooling in a power station. Well, this year, three years after 2015, everything should have been fixed. Well, the problem of the temperature of uh, water in the rivers, um, well, it generates some uh, difficulties with the work of the energy blocks. Uh, because of the cooling, because uh, of the capacity of the blocks that is going down when the, um, uh, there is no, not enough um, water Cold to... Water. Yes, exactly. So uh, it comes back every summer, and every summer we have a danger of a blackout, of complete blackout in, in Poland. It's a very, uh, very dangerous for the uh, industry. Well, uh, the, the gossip says that uh, two big uh, producers um, made a, a threat to the government even uh, that if the, 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 there will be any shortage in the uh, energy supplies, they will take their factories and uh, get away from Poland. Okay, so uh, it's very dangerous things. Let's say a few words about the 
uh, usage of power in Poland? What is the average monthly usage and what, how much we use a year? Well, it depends. The peak of the energy uh, capacity in Poland is uh, 23,000 uh, 23, um, megawatts. Uh, and it, it is the summer peak. The uh, winter peak is uh, well. It's bigger, but not. Uh, it's not. The difference is not not uh, very very huge. Uh, however, uh, we do have problems when uh, the wind stop blowing because uh, most of uh, our renewable energy comes from the wind um, wind farms. And when there is no wind, we are uh, losing uh, the, the capacity of the energy system. And then uh, we have to rely on. Um, our old coal-powered uh, uh, blocks, and uh, when the problem with cooling appears, there is a problem to the whole system. What about countries that have excess uh, renewable energy, like Sweden or Germany? Do they supply us with their uh, current, so well, to speak? Well, this is the, this is the solution for for Poland when it comes when when the lack of uh, power appears. Uh, however, it's, the the flows between countries are also dangerous because, uh, for example, when in Germany, um, the uh, wind farms produce too much energy, uh, they export it to other countries, and uh, this is a danger for the the stability of the energy because system. Because it's overloading. Yes, the, yes. The grid. So uh, we do we have to uh, understand that uh, sometimes it may save our system, but sometimes it may be a danger, so it's uh, necessary to produce our own capacities of power and to rely on our own um, energy blocks and energy uh, producers like the wind farm, like the biomass, like the hydropower and so on. How serious is this uh, current peak and lack of capacity uh, in, in Polish uh, power Plants. Well, it's getting more and more serious every year because every year we do consume more and more power, and there are uh, the, the the power that is added to the system is not enough to cover the capacity to uh, make sure that the economic growth of Poland will be secured uh, in the energy way. Uh, so we do have to find our solution, and the solution is to build some. Uh, uh, huge capacities, uh, huge energy blocks. It may be coal, of course, but it, the coal is not warmly welcomed by the Uni European Union. Um, we are still discussing the question of um, the nuclear uh, energy. We are still discussing about the future of Polish um, renewables um, and uh, where to build it on offshore, onshore. Maybe the biomass is the is the, is the answer to that uh, to that problem. Uh, however, we do have to make a, a decision very soon. For now, everyone hopes it will get cooler sooner or later and we will not use that much energy uh, that just for cooling energy peak will be out of us and everyone will be happy. Thank you very much, sir. Jakub Wiechow, you. Energetic Advisor Steri was our uh, guest. And uh, please uh, watch again Poland Daily Business Edition. <laughs>
And how do you think the, the national institutions could help us promote the alcohol abroad as well? Very good comment, because, uh, um, because uh, we, we observe uh, other countries, uh, France, Great Britain, Japan, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Chile, uh, Peru, um, uh, all these countries are promoting their national heritage, national alcohols, um, strongly. And th this is not only uh, a subject to, uh, to, to producers and exporters, uh, but uh, local diplomacy is very much involved. State agencies, like, uh, and this is my dream, uh, that the Polish ministers, Polish uh, members of, uh, of the parliament, uh, representatives of uh, state agencies will promote the heritage of Polish vodka worldwide. This is the must. This is, uh, this is, this is, Polish vodka could be like an icebreaker uh, to enter um, uh, other markets with Polish products, uh, Polish furniture, Polish agriculture um, uh, products. This is art, culture. Uh, it's easier because Polish vodka exists everywhere, is present everywhere in the world. I think it's important to change people's perception of Poland and vodka because I have often met people who thought that we drink a lot of vodka and we just over drink, um, which is not true because vodka can be served elegantly and one can only have a nice tasting of it instead of just uh, I think it's people's previous perception from the communist times of us. Not only communist times, uh, b because, because uh, vodka, mm, um, there is a nice story. Um, uh, uh, people say that, uh, uh, or the legend uh, says, that Napoleon, uh, during Napoleon time, there was a battle. And uh, Napoleon army won. And uh, French, Poles, and other nations uh, being a part of uh, Napoleon army, uh, they celebrated the victory. They drank a lot. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what they drank. Probably, probably wine or uh, or whatever. But uh, suddenly, uh, the the enemy uh, army uh, came back and uh, attacked uh, the camp of Napoleon army soldiers. And who was able to stand up and fight with invaders? Only Poles. And after that, Napoleon said to French and other nations, you should drink, but in a Polish way. So drinking like a Pole means drinking responsibly, mm -hmm. always ready for duty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Poland Daily Culture. Um, if you could tell us the history of the word vodka. Yes. Uh, in Poland, we start to say vodka refers to non-alcoholic efforts of distillation process. For example, with herbals, with fruits, with flowers, sometimes even with animal product. And uh, one quite interesting thing is that we also, for example, make vodka from snails, living snails with their shells. We believe that was good, for example, for our kidneys. Uh, I don't know if that was working. Maybe somebody <laughs> heard what he had to drink and he was thinking, no, thank you, I'm cured enough. Uh, I don't want to drink that anymore. But the Polish people have their knowledge about those things from three quite important books. The oldest will be Stefan Falimisch from 1534, but we also have uh, Marcin Sienik or Hieronym Spiczyński. And from those books, Polish people could have their knowledge what will be good, for example, for our eyes, what could help our livers, or for what we can use lavender vodka or chamonil vodka. And so we can think that vodka in those days was medicine, but it was without alcohol. So you may start to think, so where is alcohol in that story then? Uh, because there was, but it was different name for that. It was gorzałka from Polish verb, which is gorzec, and that will be in English to burn. We call it that way, and we start to drink gorzałka in a small doses, like small spoon or half of an egg. But we notice it could be good also, for example, for our stomach ache. So we also start to call it aqua vita, from Latin water of life, or how Polish people pronounce that oko vita. So to the 70th century, most vodka in their basic version will be without alcohol, unless you add a little bit of gorzałka to it. But at first it was really rarely happened. 
but after 70th century, we start to add more often. And right now, when we say about vodka, we're always thinking about something with alcohol, for sure. <laughs> So at first it was water with added, as you said, snails or...? For example, uh, water which was distillate, for example, okay. with snails or with uh, roses or uh, with many different things that old, in old Polish times we could believe that could mm -hmm. help, for example, to be much more healthier or to live longer, because this is, we speak about uh, 16th, 15th century, so this is the time when Polish people believe that maybe herbs, but it's also quite true, herbs could help you for your, uh, for your health. And how did people distillate it in those times? Uh, we have uh, knowledge about how to distillate from German people who at first make beer, but they have their knowledge uh, from the uh, east of the Europe, which was sorry, from the west of the Europe, which was, for example, France or Spain, uh, because in 18th and 19th century, uh, to the Europe came Arabic scholars with their quite important thing, uh, which is alembic, and alembic was the tool that they used to the distillation process, and all things that we use right now are most of the time based on alembic scheme. So. We know and it from that. Do you think in the previous times vodka um, was drunk a bit differently when people first invented it and added the alcohol? Uh, I think it, it was drink differently because we drink in really small doses. Uh, we know that there uh, was a um, uh, European scholar, he was called Paracelsius, and he believed that, for example, alcohol uh, could be good for our health, but he also said that the word is a poison. Everything is a poison and nothing is a poison. Only the doses make something poisonous. So I think this is the most important thing that you have to remember, that everything in big doses could kill you, mm -hmm. but in small doses everything could be good to your health. So a shot of vodka a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> yes, we, I think here we can say something like that. <laughs>Powstanie styczniowe nazywane jest czasem ostatnim powstaniem romantycznym czy też kresem romantyzmu w historii Polski. The January uprising is something referred to as the last romantic uprising or the end of romanticism in Polish history. The whole idea of revolting against a state as great as Russia during that time seemed unbelievable and in turn somewhat romantic. It isn't surprising that the January Uprising defeat brought about the idea of positivism, a positivism born out of the Prussian partition, or more precisely, in the Grand Duchy of Posen in the 1840s, brought about by Desideri Chłopowski and a group of people, November insurgents, involved with him. Ale coś, co przed rokiem 1864 było znane tylko w małym kręgu ludzi, w małym kręgu bogatych Włościan Poznania. But something that before the January Uprising was known only by a tiny number of rich people in Poznań after the 1863 insurrection was applied on Polish lands. Before anything else, Poles focused on getting richer, on industrial development. This development was particularly noticeable in Warsaw and Łódź. Łódź became a promised land, as described by Raymond in his famous novel, Warsaw expanded to three times what it was. By the end of the 19th century, Warsaw had almost 800,000 inhabitants, whereas in 1863, when it was preparing for the uprising, there were about 350 to 400,000 inhabitants. This was a great industrial development. 
So what was the obstacle to the development of this positivism? On the one hand, the development of national ideals, on the other, there were some economic factors. Russia tried to put the brakes on the Polish economy, deciding that it threatened the Russian economic plan. Positivists looked to Brits such as Herbert Spencer, who invented the term positivism, and said positivism could develop in harmony with the state, but how can you develop positivism in a country such as Russia, which is Poland's enemy? This is why nationalistic ideals began to take the forefront. A national democracy, the Polish League, was founded in 1893. Earlier, in 1882, the first big socialist party, the proletariat, was formed. The proletariat said we should focus on class and social ideals. The nationalists said the focus should be on national ideals and positivist ideals disappeared. They weren't completely gone, because positivists were still still active before the First World War, but they certainly lost momentum and were no longer a decisive power. Pozytywiści to jeszcze i przed pierwszą wojną światową starali się działać, ale na pewno stracili już impet i nie byli siłą decydującą. So would you say that uh, romanticism makes his a uh, little bit of comeback during the interwar era? Because as I know, like Marshal Piłsudski is personally a big fan of the January uprising. Piłsudski był wielkim fanem powstania styczniowego, ale przede wszystkim był ogromnym fanem literatury romantycznej. Piłsudski was a big fan of the January uprising, but first and foremost he was a big fan of romantic literature. He held the poet Juliusz Słowacki in particularly high regard, even giving him a royal-like burial at the Wawel Castle. Another romantic Polish poet was Cyprian Norwid, who said, Oh, my son, you will forget the things I write about, but your own son will remember every word. The positivists decided to ignore the romantic ideals and fighting for independence, but the following generation went back to it, the generation right after the January uprising, who made it their mission to get back Polish independence by force. The most known figure out of that generation was of course Piłsudski, but before he became a marshal, because he became a marshal in 1920 in a reborn Poland, he alluded to romantic role models, for example in his writings as the editor-in-chief of Robotnik or Worker, a paper directed at Polish workers. In this paper social issues were mentioned, but as an afterthought. The fight for an independent Poland was its main focus. Piłsudski looked for people among his readers who could fight for this independence with him. This idea unfortunately fell. Another uprising didn't interrupt. Piłsudski didn't command another insurrection, but he tried again later. In 1900 he created a shooters union named the Union of Armed Battle two years later and led a romantic army, well, army of sorts, people in uniform like scouts, who under Austrian auspices were to fight with the Russian invader. One of the consequences of the uprising is the discouragement in the idea of armed struggles against the partitioning powers. But the longing for freedom and disdain for oppressive regimes never waned and took forms in newly formed ideas instead. Joining us here is Dr. Shishov Yabonka to reveal to us how change came about and the new ideas that sprouted after the armed resistance. So. Let's talk about the more long-lasting repercussions and effects of the January uprising, and especially what it has uh, effect on the Polish psyche. After the uprising, what are people's general opinion <coughs> towards like um, armed uprising in general? Do they see it in a positive light? And what make them think about the whole event? Would they want to do it again if they're being repressed, or they just had enough? Trzeba powiedzieć że bezpośrednio po powstaniu panował niezwykle przygnębiający nastrój. Immediately after the uprising, the mood was particularly despondent. It took a few years for Poles to shake off this great trauma, where women wore black to mourn their men and there was no fun or joy to be had. They began what is known as organic work according to positivist ideals. This was a moment of great technological development. An industrial revolution passed through Europe and Poland wanted to be a part of it. They didn't want the Russians to get ahead of them. Poles were able to put up a fight and win. Greater Poland set a great example. Poles, under a Prussian government, where you could not break the law, 
were able to match the Germans economically and make it the best developed agricultural region. Here, Polish entrepreneurs were able to establish factories and function as Poles. The areas under Russian rule were much worse off. Dorównać Niemcom, ba i uczynić ze tego regionu na przykład najlepiej rozwinięty rolniczo obszar. Tam polscy przedsiębiorcy mogli zakładać fabryki i jako Polacy funkcjonować. The great compensation that part of the nobility received for their affranchisement of the peasants, which the Russians claimed to be money from the sale of Alaska, $7,300,000 was used to build thousands of homes in Warsaw. This was a period in which the architecture developed. Złotych rubli, złotych dolarów przepłynęło wtedy. Zbudowano tysiące domów w Warszawie. Churches were built, as well as factories, including, more importantly, arms factories. The part of Poland located within the Russian partition was starting to develop its first railway network. Zaboru rosyjskiego pokrył się siecią kolei żelaznej. Bardzo istotny był udział Polaków w budownictwie kolejowym. The role played by Poles in international railway construction was becoming increasingly important. Among others, a leading Warsaw industrialist, Leopold Cronenberg, financed and built the Ristula Railway, along the Vistula up to Torun, towards the Baltic Sea. Something the Poles were able to maintain was that the broad railway tracks that the Tsar wanted to prevent enemy armies from riding into Russia ended at the Vistula. Beyond the Vistula, there were only French-style tracks which suited the European style of rails. Takie, które pasowały do ogólnoeuropejskich rozstaw szyn i dzięki temu były bardzo dobrze skomunikowane z resztą Europy. Thanks to this, they were able to link up well with the rest of Europe, so at least up to the Vistula, Poland wasn't dragged away from Europe. The Julian calendar also wasn't implemented. Instead, double dating was used. The Russians took the Gregorian dates used in the rest of Europe, while the Poles took the Julian dates used in Russia. The Polish language was also preserved. Every poster and signboard, whether it be put up by a shoemaker or tailor, had to be in two languages. There was a battle over which of the languages should be used first. Patriots wrote in Polish first, then in Russian in brackets, while those fearing Russia did the opposite, gaining some recognition because of this. A quite outstanding figure in Poland was the president of Warsaw, an extremely righteous man, a Russian and Tsarist general Sokrates Starynkiewicz. Sokrates Starynkiewicz, człowiek niezwykle prawy, Rosjanin, generał carski. It is he brought two Brits to Poland, the two brothers William and Pete Lindley, who built the waterworks for our city. He left Warsaw as a city that was extremely developed. To on zostawił Warszawę niezwykle rozwiniętą. The January uprising was one of the most pivotal moments in the era when Poland was partitioned. The Poles would later on spend decades debating whether or not they had taken the correct path of resistance. During the interwar era, the veterans were treated as heroes, and they would later on serve as an inspiration for the soldiers fighting in the 1944 Warsaw Uprising. That's it for today. I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. Hi everybody and welcome to Poland Daily Travel, where in the next series of episodes we'll be traveling along the Royal Route, that's right, the Tract Krolewski in beautiful Warsaw. We'll be starting in the historic Old Town at the Cathedral of St. John. Then I'll be walking and talking with my friend Artur Gorniewski as we proceed south along Krakowski Szedmieszcze to the center of the city. You'll get to know the landmarks and historical places of interest that are most essential along the royal route. So stay with us, you won't find anything this comprehensive anywhere else. Poland Daily Travel walks and talks along the royal route. Okay, uh, you can see right behind us is a sign that says Adam Mickiewicz, uh, or Mickiewicza. Mitskiewicz, Adam Mitskiewicz is his name. 
if you want to know how to spell it. There it is behind us. So, uh, yeah, right across from us over here is a famous place. The Kino Cultura was an old uh, uh, cinema there, wasn't it? Exactly. Uh, nowadays we are having a restaurant over there and we are having Ministry of Culture in this very building okay. right next to the Royal Route. But okay. what you just said, Adama Mickiewicza. Right. Even though I say Adam Mickiewicz as the name of the guy, then when I say that this square belongs to him, I add A at the end. Uh, I, I, I add A at the end of all the words that are female. There are male and female words in our language. And please mm, take a look at the name of our country. The name of our country is Polska. Right. P-O-L-S-K-A. So at the end of our country, there is A, which means that whenever we talk about our country, we, re we refer to a lady. Uh -huh. S-K combination in the name of our country stands for belonging. And a lot of surnames in our uh, language has SK combination. For instance, my surname Gurniewski, uh -huh. or a football player Robert Lewandowski. How about this? Uh -huh. uh, and then the first three letters of the name of our country, P O L, stands for Pola, which means fields. Right, right, fields. Yeah, Poland, land of fields. Correct, yeah. Poland, yeah. land of flatlands. By the way, the name of Netherlands means flatlands in their language. Also, so yeah. in Europe, many names of the countries um, um, are such because of ice ages. Right. Because these determined such uh, area in here. And we are walking along flatlands in here, the royal route. We are passing by the Carmelites uh, monastery. Yeah, this is a monastery here, right? Yeah. We are having eclectic um, um, construction in here. It's typical Baroque style, but what's yeah. Polish has always a little bit of mixtures. So if we look at the top of the columns over there, on the top we can see that this is an, a Corinthian order because of these acanthus flower leaves over there. Uh, but then the rest of the column is not uh, Greek anymore because these columns are not curved. Uh, they are flat, so it's Roman style and uh, eclectic, a combination, a little bit of everything that's Polish. So that Polish culture, Polish kings, Polish designers were adopting a little bit of everything. And this is a typical thing for Poland that we are having a lot of mixtures. Mm -hmm. And even though 90% of Warsaw was destroyed during World War II and then Many elements were reconstructed or there were new communist elements constructed and now modern stuff is going on in here. Then look, it's still eclectic. Mm -hmm. So even though at some point 90% of our city was destroyed and then just life made it on, made it continue, made it go on, then still it's eclectic, still it's a combination. Yeah. So it's a still very nice place to visit that tells you a little bit of everything. Right. It's a... It's got a, a mixture of a lot of different influences. Exactly. Yeah. Poland Daily, we're walking on the Royal Route with Arthur. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. More to come. Poland Daily Travel. We're standing on the Royal Route in front of the Presidential Palace and next to the Bristol Hotel. Uh, this is a famous spot for obvious reasons, but uh, why don't you tell us what's going on? Well, uh, I, I will. With this building. <laughs> yeah. That's a place where our president sleeps at the moment, our presidential palace. Uh, initially, it was constructed by Polish magnate family, also very important general coming from that family, Koniec Polski family. Uh, there were many important families who owned this place. And this is also a building where Frédéric Chopin performed for the first time in his life when he was eight. Really? Exactly. Now imagine oh. all poor Soviet dignitaries were invited to enjoy a concert of 
eight years old boy. Mm -hmm. That's and incredible. Here, and yeah. this is where it started. So it started to be very important place. The first Polish president who slept in here, who slept in here, who started to spend time in here was Lech Wałęsa. And it was uh -huh. 1994 when he moved from Belvedere Palace. Which is on the royal route. Which is on the royal route. And park, Wajenki Park. And this Am is I the right? summer residence of Wajenki. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this okay. is the summer residence of another Polish king. And uh, Lech Wałęsa moved in here. And since that moment on, Polish presidents are staying in here. Original okay. building, not destroyed during World War II, used by Nazi soldiers as a Deutsch house. So the place where they were gambling. Also, we is are that having. Right? Huh. Yeah, that's why it survived. Um, and the sculpture that we are having in here of Prince Joseph Poniatowski. So he's the brother of the guy who owned the Royal Wazienki Garden, the right. Royal Wazienki. This, is, this okay. is how it all gathers together right along the Royal Route. It's a logical consequence of facts. These are fathers of Polish independence and most important people for our identity that we are meeting in here along the Royal Route. And even the building that you mentioned, the Hotel Bristol, this one was financed by Paderewski. Right, because he has his own uh, room there, doesn't he? And there's a bust of him in the hallway, isn't there? And yeah. he was the one who opened his sack after one of tournees in the US and constructed this hotel. And it's also original and it's not destroyed. And it's at the moment oldest Polish hotel um, continuing, available. Continuing, mm -hmm. Oldest continuing Polish hotel? Yeah, very good. Uh, anything else we should know about this particular building? That was pretty good. Yes, what we should know at the moment is like minus five Celsius degrees in here, so it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about time to go inside. Yes, I wanted to say it like in between the lines. Shall we go inside? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, folks, we're going inside because it is getting cold. As much as we like walking on the royal route, we'd like to do it with feet that are not frozen and hands the same. Okay, uh, Arthur, what do you say? Let's go. Yeah? Let's do it. Okay, we're going inside. I'm going to take you to a different place. 